Hello. On behalf of the Churches of Christ, and Christ's Way Bible Institute, we welcome you to the rebroadcast of our Monday morning class. It is our desire to assist all who are interested in various Bible, and New Testament doctrines and teachings. We set as a goal one online class each Monday morning. Information and links to the live meeting can be found on our website. www. The Churches of Christ. Life. On the live meetings page. May God bless your studies in His Word. We're going to be talking about the book of Numbers. Uh, the lesson title is Man's Journey to the Promised Land, or Mankind's Journey to the Promised Land. And I hope you had an opportunity. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read the book of Numbers. And so today, while we're talking about the Old Testament book of Numbers, we're also going to be looking at the parallel between uh, their journey through the wilderness and our journey through life, ultimately reaching the final promised land. But before we get into the lesson directly today, we have a little special something uh, to announce. Today uh, is a very special day for Brother Stanley and his wife, Sister Rada. Uh, it is their anniversary. They've very, uh, become very special uh, to me. And so I just want to honor them with this. And happy anniversary, Brother Stanley and you and Sister Rada. We really appreciate the good work that you do on behalf of Christ Way Bible Institute. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I have a chart up here on the screen that I also sent to the uh, message group, Friends of uh, Christ Way Bible Institute. Uh, you can get this. I hope you can have access to a printer to print off the worksheet. Uh, if you don't have access to a printer, uh, please contact Brother Stanley and we'll see if we can make some copies and mail them out to those who don't have them. But as you read and study in the book of Numbers, as you go across the top, you'll see some of the uh, various chapters, uh, principal chapters and places along the way in the book of Numbers, as far as it applies to the children of Israel. We have looked in the book of Genesis and we've talked about the creation of mankind. We have seen the creation of the nations. We also, through Abraham, saw the creation of the nation of Israel through uh, Jacob. And so we've studied the book of Genesis and we saw the children of Israel in Egypt. We've talked about the book of Exodus, which talks about uh, bringing the children of Israel as a nation and as a people out of Egypt into uh, heading toward at least the promised land. We looked at the book of Leviticus last week, which talked about the setting up of the various uh, implements in the tabernacle and in the worship of God with some various purity laws and sacrificial laws. Today, as we come into the book of Numbers, we're actually picking up really at the end of Exodus. A lot of times when people are studying uh, the early part of the Bible, they will study Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then they'll go back and study Leviticus, even though that's not the way it's laid out in, in the Bible. But uh, really, this book picks up where we left off in our study at the end of the book of Exodus with, as we see in the chart here, the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. And as the scripture was read just a few moments ago, uh, God commanded Moses as 
They were there in the wilderness with the tabernacle set up in their encampment. God commanded Moses that there should be what today we would think of as a census or a numbering of the men of Israel. And this numbering was primarily for the men capable of acting as soldiers in war. And so the specifics here are uh, those uh, that would be able, as we said, to fight as soldiers. Therefore, the numbering that we have does not include those who were uh, before of the age of 20. And so children under the age of 20 would not have been included into this. Neither would the women and the aged men would not either be included in this counting. And so we see uh, some principal aspects broken down. And as we said, they are still at Sinai. But after we get and take care of some business that we'll talk about here shortly, they begin to move in the direction of Moab. And once they reach Moab, we have certain aspects that take place along that way. And so what we have here in the first part of the book of Numbers through the uh, ninth chapter is they're preparing the way, numbering the people, putting together in essence what could be an army for the conquest of the promised land. That's really what the numbering was about. We're getting ready, or they would, should have been getting ready, to go in and to conquer and take uh, the land of Israel as God had promised them. And so the preparation of that was the encampment, and we'll talk about that in a little while. But uh, they had the numbering of the men of war. They had the encampment, the layout of Israel's sort of an organization of the people by their tribes. And then there is this 39-year journey uh, which moves to Moab. And this is a sad time for the people of Israel because they should have went in and conquered the land. This is what happens in the 12th chapter as the spies are sent into the land to spy out and they see the greatness and the wonder of the land. Uh, these 12 spies come back, 10 give a bad report saying, you know, there's giants in the land. We can't take the land. But jo uh, but uh, Caleb uh, and Joshua say we can take the land and they wanted to go. But they turned, the 10 who gave a, a bad report, turned the hearts of Israel against going in and possessing the land. And they basically sentenced that generation of people to about 39 years worth of wandering uh, in the wilderness. And then as they arrive eventually in Moab for a few months, they're there before uh, they make their journey across Jordan and into the promised land. I'm not, I haven't sent this chart out, but it's going to be on the video, Lord willing. Uh, so the book of Numbers becomes a book of the wanderings of the uh, people of Israel. It should have been a book about the conquest of Canaan. But that book is going to have to wait till we go over to the book of Joshua because of the murmurings and the complainings, uh, the rejection of God's uh, intent. They were punished by wandering in the wilderness until that first generation had passed away and a new generation was born and came up so that they might enter the promised land. And so this chart gives you a little bit about what we're uh, talking about. Breakdown of some of the, the first census, census uh, the encampment. It talks about the priestly duties. When we talk about the Levites, Aaron and his sons were Levites, and God gave them the duty of the high priest 
and working directly inside the tabernacle. But there were other Levites that were not directly descendants of Aaron or directly related to Moses. And so there is a breakdown of the various duties of the other families other than Aaron's and how they would minister to God and purifying the people, setting them apart. And then we see the journey. And of course, through this period of wandering is the time of murmuring, uh, the bad report of the spies. There's murmurings against Moses. Uh, there is a period of time where God sustained them through the manna in the wilderness. And the manna is a, a miraculous thing. It's referred to in the scriptures as angel's food. And there's really a discussion and, and, a, and, a, and a lack of, of really a final answer as when it says angel's food, if it was food provided by angels, or if it's the food that angels would eat. Uh, again, I generally think of it as food that was provided by the angels as they watched over the children of Israel. This is a sad time in the wanderings of the people of Israel. For 39 years, they wandered in the wilderness and some people have said they spent 39 years making a two-week journey. Somewhere between two and uh, four weeks, maybe six weeks, they should have been able to go into the land of Israel, cross the Jordan, go into Israel, and begin to possess the land. But sadly, that generation is lost, and that's what we read about. One of the, the main things uh, that takes place is uh, Balaam, the false prophet, who wants uh, to, uh, who's asked to curse the children of Israel and is offered financial uh, reward, if you will. And God intercedes and refuses to allow him to curse the children of Israel. Uh, but nonetheless, Balaam finds a way around that by teaching the people uh, how to cause Israel to uh, fall away from God. And they tempted them through the lust of the flesh. And again, sadly, uh, this brought about much sorrow for the people of Israel. Then as we said, there is in the latter part of the book of Numbers, the, uh, the part of where God prepared the people to cross Jordan and receive the promised land. As we look in the uh, chart, I have a chart here about the camp of Israel, some of the things that we're looking at in the early part of the book of Numbers was getting the people organized, getting them organized into a camp based upon their families, and they were grouped together in families of three, with one primary leader in those camps. And I'll explain a little bit of that as, as we go along here. But you'll see to the west, the camp of Ephraim there at the top. To the north on the right is the camp of Dan. And to the east is the camp of Judah. And to the west, uh, what we see to the south, to the left, is the camp of Reuben. And here is the uh, totaling of the census of those who were counted and numbered along the way, fighting men uh, who would be able to uh, take the promised land. And so when we break this down, we see that Reuben, Simeon, and Gad had 151,400 men of war. And this was referred to as the camp of Reuben. The head of the tribe of Reuben was, in essence, the captain over this group of individuals. And their ensign, or the banner that they marched under, had the image of a man. 
we come over to the camp of Ephraim, we find it had Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, 108,100 fighting men. And the symbol of that group was the ox. And the tribe of Ephraim, the head of the tribe of Ephraim, was a captain over these soldiers. Then under the camp of Judah, we have Judah, Ishkar, and Zebulun, 186,400. The symbol of their banner, uh, Ensign, is the lion, and Judah was the captain of the tribes. And of course, we know one of the things that Jesus is referred to is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so Jesus continues to carry that concept or that idea along uh, later on into the New Testament. The camp of Dan had Dan, Naphtali, and Asher, 157,600 fighting men. And so you can see that the uh, Reuben and Dan had about the same number of men. Ephraim, uh, on the other hand, had about 50,000 less. And there was a little bit more in the tribe of Judah. In the middle are the Levites, and the Levites were the priests of God, and they encamped in the middle, and along with that uh, is where the tabernacle, where we see the name Levi there, uh, we would see that that is part of the encampment, and where Levi is, right in the very center of that would have been the tabernacle, and also the tent of Moses, which is referred to as the tent of meeting, where the people of Israel met with Moses. The tent of meeting and the tabernacle is not the same thing. They were two different things. Uh, and so we have the layout here. Levi was not a fighting uh, tribe, and so they cared for and guarded and protected and watched over uh, the tabernacle, and the things of the worship of God. Now, what I want us to look at right here, as we look at these tribes, we've talked about the ensign or the banner or the symbol that was used of the tribes. And we have the ox, the man, the lion, and the eagle. And as we look at that, I want to take this image over and look in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 4, beginning in verse 6, we have a, we have a, a, a sight into heaven. It says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal in the midst of the throne. Around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes, before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Notice this. When we look at the symbolism in this study, we understand that the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies represents the dwelling place of God. The priests uh, represent, in essence, the angelic servants of God. And we're told that there were these four beasts full of eyes all the way around. Notice, uh, the first beast was like a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The second beast was like a calf. The calf is the ox. The ox is of the camp of Ephraim. And then there was the beast that had a face of a man. This is Reuben. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. And so those ensigns and the tribes further represent the things that are in heaven. So as are things in heaven, so are 
things in earth. These are the actual, these are the physical representations, the types and shadows. And I just think that's a, a rather interesting thing to uh, consider. But this is the layout, the encampment uh, of the children of, of Israel as they prepared to journey and as they journeyed through uh, those 39 years uh, in the wilderness. This exodus through the wilderness uh, has some symbolic uh, teachings for us as well as we study in the book of Numbers what was going on. Their journey through the wilderness parallels our life in Christ or our life in this world where we have to go through the times of testing and of trials. And so we see some parallels, and we're going to use this chart to our study today. It's another chart that you're free to, to use in your uh, studies. This is where it can be located online. It's not my chart. We're just using it. But first of all, we see uh, the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt, and we are enslaved in sin. Life without Christ uh, is life lived in sin. Uh, we, through the salvation and the purging, uh, ultimately move towards the reward of our eternal home with God. Let's look at a few verses that kind of parallels this. When Paul was writing the church at Rome in Romans 6, 17 and 18. Paul said, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. When we look at the children of Israel's coming out of Egypt, Paul further comments in 1 Corinthians 10, saying, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So the cloud represents the Spirit of God. The water represents the purification or the washing. And so as the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea, it is a type or shadow of our baptism where we are baptized both of water and spirit, the Spirit of God, as we see in Colossians, the second chapter, through faith in the operation of God, he purges us. Uh, from our sins. And so uh, as we look at Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So we have a dividing line. The dividing line for the children of Israel was the Red Sea where they were baptized into Moses, as Paul says, and a dividing line between sin and salvation is our belief in baptism and cleansing through the water and the Spirit, being born again, as Jesus says uh, to Nicodemus in John, the third chapter. And so having been baptized uh, into Moses, the children of Israel uh, were to find refuge in the wilderness in preparation for moving into the promised land. We, having obtained salvation from sin, live in Christ in this life, again preparing ourselves for that eternal reward. In the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, as it pertains to the children of Israel going into the land of Canaan and being led by Joshua, it says, for if Jesus, and Jesus here is referring to Joshua, not our Lord, Joshua and our Lord, Jesus had the same name. Joshua's name 
uh, and transliterated into Greek is Jesus. Jesus' Greek name back into the Hebrew is Joshua or Yeshua. And so if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not have afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. When the children of Israel came out of the wilderness and came in to possess the land of Canaan, this was the land of, that was promised to their father Abraham, and God gave to them the land which he promised. And for us, our reward is heaven, and this is the true and everlasting reward, the eternal reward in eternity with God. And so this journey that we find in the book of Numbers parallels our journey through this life. Philippians 1, verse 23, Paul says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The Apostle Paul understood that while in this life we have hope, and in this life we have salvation, he also understood that there is an eternity for the people of God. And so he was in a strait betwixt two uh, to continue in the, this life, in this wilderness, if you will, of life, or to go on and be with the Lord. For him to enter into his eternal reward was a far greater thing for him but to stay in this life was better for the people of God in that he could answer questions, still continue to write books and letters and build up what we know as uh, the uh, New Testament. But speaking toward uh, the reward, Jesus on the night that he was betrayed in John 14 says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And as we look at this, we see that this separation of death and the entering of the children of Israel into Canaan, one of the things that symbolized their entering, of course, into Canaan was crossing Jordan. And as we said, when we sing some of our spiritual songs, we many times talk about crossing Jordan. And when we're talking about crossing Jordan, yes, it alludes to the children of Israel entering into Canaan or the promised land. But for us today, when we think of crossing over into Jordan, we're talking about heaven itself. Uh, passing through death, uh, through death instead of the river Jordan itself. Jordan symbolizes the end of the old and the beginning of the true reward, which is heaven. When Peter was writing to the church in 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 10, he said, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. While we are in the kingdom now, as we are in Christ, and the kingdom and the church is the same, we're looking for that everlasting kingdom that is heaven itself. And one of the things that Peter tells us about here is uh, preceding this, of course, are some of the 
virtues that we need to build into our life as we separate ourselves from sin. And we are always cautioned about this. As much as the children of Israel were saved out of Egypt and were brought into the wilderness to enter into Canaan, the sad part of the book of Numbers is because they failed, they fell in the wilderness and did not reach Canaan. And for those who sinned and transgressed against God, many of those will not see heaven. Likewise, in Christ, we need to be careful that while we're in this life, feel subject to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that we walk in the light as his light, that we not lose our reward. Jesus said in Revelation 22 and 12, And behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Jesus' warning is, I come quickly. Uh, that didn't necessarily mean time-wise from when that was written. But what he means is, when he returns, he will return quickly. There won't be signs of his coming. He comes as a thief in the night. And so death is much the same. Whether we suffer physical death, wait for the resurrection, whether we're alive and remain till Jesus comes, these things will take place in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And so we must prepare ourselves now in this time so that when Jesus comes, heaven will be our home. As we uh, kind of sum things up a bit today, I'd like to go back and read some from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, that is, our warning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, Take heed, lest he fall. This is an important set of passages that lay out this parallel. 
We can read about the strugglings of the children of Israel in the book of Numbers. But we also see in the New Testament that much the same as the children of Israel in the wilderness was subject to temptations and sin and murmurings and failed, we are also warned throughout the New Testament that we need to be very careful because such as at Corinth and those at Galatia and many other places that we find in the scriptures speak of those who were going back and falling back into sin. And as Paul asks in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And his statement is, God forbid. As a people of God in this wilderness that we live now, in a sinful and polluted and defiled world, we need to be very careful that the life that we're living is not one where we're fooling ourselves, involving ourselves in the sins of the flesh while believing that the grace of God will keep us safe. Children of Israel perished, that generation did, in the wilderness. One of the things that we see and one of the sad things is that when God numbered the men of war at the beginning of the journey, and then he took a census again of the second generation of those who had been in the wilderness. The numbers really didn't change. The entire generation of people had perished in the wilderness. Numbers symbolizes man's journey to the promised land, whether we're looking at the actual journey of the children of Israel under the leadership of Moses and then Joshua, or if we're looking at the leadership of what we know today as the church, the body of Christ, as we are led by another Joshua, Jesus, and we're searching and seeking and trying for that promised land. And so we want to consider and think about these things in our lives. We're going to open it up to some questions here in just a moment, but if you would, bow with me in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for your watch care over us and your many blessings. We pray, Father, that we might learn from the things that we have studied today and that we might share them with others. We know, Father, that we live in a world that is filled with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Father, we pray that we might open our minds to your will and to your way. Keep us, Father, a people that can walk in the light as you're the light that we can have fellowship one with another. But the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, will keep us uh, from sin and will forgive us our trespasses. Lead us, Father, and guide us with your word. Open our hearts, our minds, our lives to the truth of your scriptures. Father, be with the sick, the afflicted, the hurting, those who are in the war-torn areas. Father, we know that there is much need of improvement. Through sin, our world is being destroyed daily. Father, protect us from the evil. As Jesus prayed, Father, we don't at this time ask you to take us out of the world. We have a purpose to live, but keep us, Father, from the wicked one and keep us from the evil. Bless us and keep us in your grace as we walk together in your truth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. 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 Does anyone have any amen. questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, brother, for your wonderful lessons.
Okay, now you can turn on your microphone and video. And if you have any question, I know Brother uh, Brian Barrett, uh, happy to help you. Yeah. Hello, dear brother. This is Joshua. Hi. Yeah, before, Hi. Yeah, yeah. before we wind up in our classes, I need to ask a question that uh, why did God order a census in the book of Numbers? Uh, he he was trying to uh, actually uh, separate out the men of war from the rest of Israel. And so uh, what he was actually doing was uh, determining who would be the fighting men as they got ready and were getting ready to go in to the promised land. Uh, we don't expect a six-year-old boy to fight, and we don't expect, uh, you know, women to necessarily fight, and we don't expect the aged to fight. And so it was uh, really setting up the army of Israel and breaking it up, as we see in these camps, uh, into four encampments of soldiers and their families so that they would understand when they went to war under whose direction or leadership that we are following. And that's the same today. We have a commander in chief. And at that time, that would have been Moses, really. And uh, after uh, Moses came Joshua. And then as we come down in the military, many times we have generals. And so if you think of each of the heads of those four camps, would have been the generals who would have taken uh, instruction from Moses and Joshua. And then underneath each of those were leaders who were directing smaller groups of soldiers. And so the census was one to get a count to see how many fighting men they had. And two, it was to organize those men then into encampments and divisions uh, so that they would be ready and would be able to fight and work together uh, in the conquest of the promised land. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, it, it was a process that uh, took some time. There were several weeks involved, and part of that was probably moving their tents and organizing and meeting with the people who were going to be uh, the leaders of each of those tribes directing their soldiers. And so uh, the book of Numbers is really just about organizing for the conquest. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time and study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time. May God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the churches of Christ salute you.